we're gonna do the first of many, uh, approximately 20, I do believe, updates for my read a book from every country in the world because I'm a nerd challenge. I thought I'd check in every 10 books. That seems reasonable. That's about once a month. And just let you know what I've been reading, how it's been going, what I think of the book. Yeah, and every 10 countries, every 10 books, we'll, we'll, we'll do one of these. And I'm very keen to discuss some things with you. Let's, let's begin, shall we? The first book that I read was Smaller and Smaller Circles, a crime fiction novel by Filipino author F.H. Vatican. I, I listened to the audiobook for this one. I got it on Audible. I think I paid a credit for it. I don't think it was on Plus. It's set in Manila in the 1990s, I do believe. Uh, and we followed two Catholic priests, one of whom is an anthropologist and one of whom is a psychologist. And they're brought in by the NBI, which is like the FBI, but Filipino. They're brought in to help solve a series of murders that have been occurring in Payatas, which is a, a suburb of Manila with like a large dump site area where people go to like scavenge stuff and bodies have been showing up and it's causing a bit of alarm as one may suspect. So yeah, we follow these two dudes as they try and solve the case basically. It's a very excellent, excellent detective novel. They're not detectives, but you know what I mean. There is a lot of the book that is getting through red tape and that's typically not my favorite like kind of plot point so i'm just like just get to the just get to solving the crime i don't care about what your higher ups think about you interacting with civilians in this manner like whatever you know uh, but in this instance it really kind of highlights the problems and the incompetences of the uh, both the filipino authorities and also the catholic church uh which are the two kind of major institutions that we see uh throughout this book i love the friendship between science and jerome it was very wholesome it was excellent really love the detail and the sense of place in manila i think that it was a really excellent place to start this challenge because it really sort of captured captured the essence of the philippines not that i would know i've never been there but it just you know it was a very strong sense of place in the book which i think was done very well five stars five stars to kick off i recommend i did look up to see if this author had written anything else and she has not which is tremendously upsetting but i would love to read more similar stuff so if there's anything if you've read this and there's something out there that's a bit similar maybe let me know because i would be keen I may or may not have just received a book mail. Will not be opening it now because I know what it is and it's a different video, but I'm so excited for it. So do stick around. Oh, I'm so keen. Okay. The second book that I read was The Greenhouse by <coughs> a novel by Icelandic author Uva Arva Ulfsdotter. I apologize. I did look up how to pronounce it and the pronunciation guide made a, made a consonant sound that I have never heard before and my mouth cannot do. So I will try my best with all of these names not to be an ignorant Bergen Australian. This was translated from Icelandic into English by Brian Fitzgibbon and I listened to this on audiobook as well. This I think I got on Kindle Unlimited when I did the free trial uh, and I think it had an audiobook with it as well so that was cool. This is a very cozy book about a young man leaving home for the first time to go and be a gardener in a famous yet neglected forest garden uh, at a monastery in a small, unnamed European country. It deals with a lot of issues, but at the same time it's not very plot-heavy, if you know what I mean. So he's grieving the loss of his mother, he's dealing with becoming a father at the ripe old age of- how old is he? 22? Um, and it kind of explores him building a relationship with the mother of his child, and with himself and the world around him and his family. It has very strong, believable characters, um, not a particularly exciting plot but the vibes were immaculate. I had a really good time with this. It's not particularly long, so if you want just the kind of short, interesting, pleasant read uh, that dabbles with some deep stuff but is mostly just a good time, then I recommend this. Four stars. The next book I read was Seven Years in Tibet by Heinrich Haro. Heinrich is Austrian and Tibet is Tibet, uh, but I read this for Liechtenstein. Uh, when Anne Morgan did this, she read this book for Liechtenstein as well, so this makes it okay. Uh, it is a Liechtensteinian book in that uh, Heinrich Hara wrote it whilst in Liechtenstein. Um, it, he's not Liechtensteinian and it's not about Liechtenstein, but this was the best that I could do. <laughs> if you are Liechtensteinian, uh, hello. If there's any uh, novels in English from your country that I'm not aware of, let me know because um, this was good, but it had nothing to, nothing to do with Liechtenstein. 
Anyway, uh, I got this from the library. So it's a memoir. He's an Austrian mountaineer and Olympic ski champion. Just an all-around very macho dude. He gets, um, he's on a Himalayan expedition. I don't know if it's an Everest expedition or it's just a regular Himalayan expedition. I imagine, what, when was this? The 40s? It may have been Everest. It probably wasn't Everest. Anyway, he gets stuck in India because he's climbing Himalayan mountains at the time of the outbreak of World War II and he uh, becomes a prisoner of war because India at the time was under British rule and he was Austrian slash German. He says in the book he's German, he's Austrian, I don't know. He makes two escape attempts. Given that there were two attempts made, you know how the first one went. The second one, he uh, successfully walked into Tibet. He documents his travels around the country, uh, and it seemed like a mostly very uncomfortable and unpleasant experience. I personally probably would have taken my chances with the British. But we do get some very delightful and unique insights into a country that up until that time no one really knew anything about, and after that time fell under Chinese rule. So we have this very like specific window of time that we get a cool look at through this memoir. It's quite fun while we're like gallivanting around, it gets a bit boring when we get to Lhasa. Uh, and there are some moral questions about Heinrich Hara's character. He was associated with the Nazi party, he's since expressed regret about this, um, and I don't think he was particularly involved given he spent World War II romping around the Himalayas. What was more concerning to me was the fact that he had a wife and child in Europe that just were not mentioned at all in the book and whom he did not seem particularly concerned about or in any particular hurry to get back to, given once he got to Lhasa he kind of just chilled out and tutored the Dalai Lama. So yeah, some things to think about. Overall, it was very, it was very good, very interesting. I did enjoy it. The writing style, very straightforward. Not written by a writer, but written by like an explorer, if you know what I mean. I gave this three stars. Then I read The Silent Patient, a psychological thriller by Cypriot author Alex Michaelides. I got this from my local library. Um, <laughs> I can understand why people like this. It was very page turnery. However, I'm just gonna read some Goodreads reviews that summarize what I think. Uh, skip ahead if you don't want spoilers. I, most, lots of people have read this, so if you've read this, you can watch this. Um, but if you want to read this, don't watch this, you know. Basically, I do. I did not. I, it was okay to read. I read it in, I think, two sittings, and it was an alright experience. The content of the book, however, was a little questionable. Louise says... So many times we as readers were expected to buy into implausible actions by the characters, like Alicia's cousin beating Theo over the head with a baseball bat and knocking him out because he thought he was an intruder in his yard, not even his house, and then not to mention Theo feeling fine, not needing any medical attention, or just overlooking unbelievable scenarios like Theo following his wife's lover for miles and never once actually seeing his face. When the police investigate the scene of Alicia's husband's death, how do they not find the rope and the wire that was used to tie up Alicia, and who has enough rope and wire just lying around in house to tie up two adults anyway. And another doozy, Theo injects Alicia with enough morphine to put her in a coma for the rest of her life, but she has time to find a pen and a diary and write a very lucid long entry explaining Theo's role in everything? Besides the fact that she would be completely out of it and totally incapable of writing, even if she could, why wouldn't she, I don't know, go get help because you've just been injected with a lethal dose of morphine instead of writing a short story? And then hide her diary in a picture frame? Seriously? It's almost funny. Yes, yeah, so there were a lot of plot, there were a lot of questionable plot moments. Yeah, I found it not super believable, a little bit. It just didn't feel very well thought out, you know? Emily says, aside from its flaws as a psychological thriller, Michael Eades demonstrates that he knows nothing about mental health diagnoses, treatments, and, and indicated medications, but the biases he displays in this novel contribute to a culture of misinformation that may discourage a reader who needs treatment from therapy from getting it, and may discourage other readers from complying with a treatment plan that includes prescription medications in amounts that the data shows to have therapeutic benefits. The girlfriend then wife of the narrator describes herself as crazy a dozen or more times and yet this is not relevant to any sort of mental health diagnoses over the span of the novel. In the span of 10 pages he describes characters being in a medicated haze but the med he names wouldn't cause that effect at any dosage. One psychotherapist meets with a patient two to three times and instead of evidencing any interest in the health of the patient he primarily focuses on how her behavior might be disturbing her spouse. Another psychotherapist agrees to change a patient's prescription med on a whim and overnight without any plan for gradual step down or other concern for patient impact 
impact, a third character presses unidentified meds into a patient's hands and requires that she consume them in his slash her presence. None of the medical professionals, save the one risking malpractice, demonstrate competency or concern for the welfare of their patients. This was another thing that I had a big problem with. No one seemed remotely qualified to do their jobs. Like, <laughs> it did not feel like a legitimate experience at a legitimate psychological treatment place. I don't know how well researched this was, but I, yeah, it felt weird. It just was weird, man. Uh, and then the Boris's review was quite good too. Overall, the writing was average, the characters were flawed, not in like a fun, intentional way, but in a damaging, unintentional way, and the representation of mental illness, and especially women, uh, left a lot to be desired. I give this two stars. But if you like this, uh, let me know, and we can have a discussion, because I know lots of people do. Then I read Reading the Ceiling uh, for The Gambia, which is a novel by Dara Foster, uh, and I read this on Kindle. I think I paid for this one, but like three bucks or something? I don't think it was that much. This is a story about a young Gambian woman who has just turned 18 and decides to lose her virginity. She narrows down her choices of suitable partners to three, and the book is us following and examining the three different trajectories that her life takes after sleeping with each of these possible men. There were snatches of quality writing, but the nature of the book just kind of led itself to a very scattered plot and a lot of characters that I felt no connection to whatsoever because it was kind of three stories in the, in the space of one. Yeah, it was an interesting interpretation of the butterfly effect, but I don't love the message that sleeping with a dude will drastically change the entire trajectory of your life. I, I feel like that's maybe not a great moral? I don't know. This one was just a little, a little bit weird for me. I gave it two stars, but a strong two stars. Then I read Behold the Dreamers by Mbolo Mboy. This was my book for Cameroon. Uh, I listened to the audiobook of this on Libby. This is a story that follows a Cameroonian family in New York City in 2008. The father is employed by a Wall Street businessman to be the chauffeur of his family. And this really just examines the uh, struggles of immigration with the 2008 financial crisis as kind of a backdrop for the whole story. It was very well written, very well rounded, believable characters. Um, I just don't really understand what I was supposed to get out of it, you know? Because, like, no spoilers, but kind of spoilers, everyone just gets progressively more miserable. The end? I don't know. I'm not saying that books require happy endings, but I just, I don't know. I felt a little unsatisfied with the ending of this, so I give it three stars. The United States of America. For this country, I could read essentially whatever I wanted. So, when one can read what one wants, what does one read? One reads unhinged 1950s lesbians. Jack, this is Carol Eyre. Huh. Pleased to meet you. Likewise. This is The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. I earned this, I bought this book. For those unaware, this is the book that Carol the movie was based off, the one with Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. To be completely honest, I found this book very weird. And I think it's mostly because, like, culture has just changed so much since the 1950s and some of the behaviors in here i'm just like that's not appropriate social interaction but i guess it was at the time i don't know followed therese who is a young set designer trying to make her way in new york city she meets carol at a department store and immediately falls in love as his lesbian custom they move in on the second date the end. Um, they have a very strange and uncomfortable series of encounters after their first meeting, uh, in which I guess they fall more and more in love with each other because they then go on a very wholesome road trip, and everything is fabulous until they realize that trouble has followed them from New York to Waterloo, uh, and they must face some unfortunate consequences. It read like the bell jar, but gay. <laughs> like, they were very unhinged. I liked it. I gave it four stars. I think it's probably three, but I gave it four because, you know, Kate Blanchett. Yeah, I do think this is worth reading, but just, like, be warned, it is weird. Andorra. For Andorra, I read The Teacher of Cheops by Albert Salvador. This is the book that everyone reads for Andorra when they're doing this challenge. It's like the only Andorran book that you can get in English. And it's about ancient Egypt, because of course it is. This was translated from Spanish by Mark Brian Duckett. Uh, I read this on Kindle as well, this was another one that I got on my free trial. This is a story set in ancient Egypt around the time of the first pyramids being built. They're kind of a, a bit of a plot point. Uh, we follow a man who was once a slave, but through a twist of fate has found himself 
uh, as the accountant to the royal family, and we kind of follow his life and interactions. The plot is okay, but what really stood out was how well researched the story was. There were lots of like super interesting and unique details about Egypt that just made it like feel very real. It was very extremely well researched. Commendable, commendable stuff. Uh yeah, it wasn't anything spectacular, but I enjoyed my time here. And yeah, I definitely appreciate all the research that went into constructing the setting. Uh strong three stars. The ninth book is The Ardent Swarm by, by Tunisian author Yama Manai. Uh, this was translated from the French by Lara Vignaud. Uh, I listened to the audiobook for this one as well. This follows a beekeeper in an unnamed country, it's Tunisia, and his quest to save his hives from some foreign invaders that have destroyed one of his hives and have come back for, for more bees. Uh, the honey. I think the honey is probably what they're after. Uh, so we focus on we focus on this beekeeper, but kind of in the background of the story uh, is the the country's struggle for democracy and and its first time kind of being a democratic nation uh, and the political upheaval and. Um, manipulation that accompanies this. I found it a little bit hard to follow at first, but once I got into it, it was very enjoyable. I did like this. The ending especially was particularly wonderful, if a little violent. Not to give too much away, but if you enjoy wholesome old men uh, using the power of nature against bad dudes, then you you may enjoy yourself here. I give this a strong three stars. And then book number 10, Chess by Stefan Zweig. This was my Austria pick. Uh, this was translated from the German by Anthea Bell, and I have my own copy of this one. Uh, this is a book that is kind of about chess, but is mostly about the human mind and how it can be its own enemy. We follow our protagonist who's on a ship to Argentina. He and some other passengers learn that the world chess champion is on board. They challenge him to a game, uh, and they do very poorly, as expected, until a mysterious stranger in the crowd uh, suggests some brilliant moves and they hold the world champion to draw. Uh, and we then learn the story about this fascinating individual. It's pretty good. I enjoyed this tremendously. Very short as well, so excellent, excellent short little book. Strong four stars. So those are the uh, first 10 books that I've read for this challenge. Uh, only 188 to go.